You're listening to another episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. And by the way, uh, you and I were talking the other day. We realized we're doing a true crime series here, aren't we? Yeah, this is a true crime podcast. It really is. It just is. happens to be David Brooks is the criminal. We know that yeah. from the beginning. So there's no suspense. Not None at all. Well, there's some suspense as to uh, where this is all going, unless you've lived over the last 20 years, in which case you know right where it's going. Yeah. Um, and all of his- And how bad can it be? And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. even I, as we've been talking through this- didn't realize <clears throat> Holy shit. in toto yeah. how bad it was, yeah. but it's so bad. Yeah. And all of his enablers, all of his aiders yeah. and abettors, all the wheelmen and women who, who give him all the runway he needs, uh, the people who follow him, who emulate his message, who, and he's, his message isn't original. He just figures out where the beltway common wisdom is today and articulates it in the New York times. And it's always wrong. And it's always headed in the wrong direction. And when you read it over time, you know, I got that look from you yesterday as we're going through these notes going, holy shit, he, this is what you've been going through the last 17 yeah. years. Yeah. Like, oh my God, this guy is just a monster. He's a yep. fucking monster. Yep. Yes, he is. Yep. He's a monster in plain sight. And that's what's so interesting about charting the course of his career as a proxy for the mainstream media. Now, in our previous episode, the remember the bad thing that was never, ever going to happen, happened. It finally happened. Donald Trump swept the GOP primaries. He won the GOP nomination and then won the election while he lost the popular vote by 3 million votes. And with that, the crumbling facade of fairy tales and lies that David Brooks and the rest of the media had been desperately propping up for decades finally collapsed, which exposed the true, leering, racist heart of the Republican Party. The Republican Party that was exactly as liberals had been describing it and warning about for decades. So guess what happened then? Well, the obvious answer, the answer that would be a no-brainer in virtually any other business would be, let's get rid of all the people who've been horribly wrong about everything and replace them with people who are right about things. Mm -hmm. But this assumption is based on a profound misunderstanding of the role the political media plays in American life. Their job has nothing to do with journalism or being right. You you would think pundits' jobs would be being right about things. And no, no, it doesn't. It's not about accurately forecasting outcomes or thoughtfully interpreting events. The job of political pundits and the mainstream media is to spin fables that make their audience feel smart and well-informed by reinforcing and validating the audience's biases. This is the meaning of the line at the very end of that movie, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. There are lots of facts about American politics and history which millions of Americans do not want to believe. They have built their lives and civic identities on myths and fairy tales, and they become angry and sometimes violent whenever someone threatens to put a dent in those fairy tales. This is why there has been such a backlash against the removal of Confederate monuments. Why the outrage over the obvious lie about critical race theory being some sort of white-hating curriculum being taught in elementary school. Yeah, right. This lie drove hundreds of idiots to school board meetings and to the polls, despite it being repeatedly debunked. And this uh, backlash, so to speak, is why millions of Republicans still believe Vince Foster was murdered and Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States and the 2020 election was stolen. Because if you want to hold your audience when your lies collapse, you've got to give them an escape route. This has been true on the right for decades. Across conservative media, the most eager allies of the professional liars are the very people to whom they have been lying. 
because it is so much more painful to admit you've been a chump all along, that the dirty commie left has been right all along, than to just shrug off the old lies and start repeating the new ones. So much easier to tell yourself that even if you've been lied to all along, the other side is so much worse that it doesn't matter. And, and that pathology on the right, which I'm sure almost all of our listeners are very familiar with, has been well understood and well documented for a very, very long time. It's why all the advice you hear about how to deal with Republicans sounds like hostage negotiations or dealing with a rabid possum. You don't provoke them. Don't raise your voice. Don't make any sudden gestures. Don't mention the past. <laughs> back, away, back away very slowly. He's always very respectful. Very, don't antagonize them. Just whisper quietly. But what's almost never mentioned is that both ciderists have exactly the same pathology because both ciderists completely dominate the large public venues where such discussions happen. They don't have to be loud. They don't have to be ostentatious like Republicans. They don't have to shout for attention because they already control the op-ed pages of major publications and who gets to be in them and where the network and cable TV cameras point and who gets to be in front of them. And they use that control to do for their audiences exactly what Fox News and conservative radio does for their audiences. Spin fables that make their audience feel smart and well-informed by reinforcing and validating their biases. And what is the big lie that the mainstream media readers and viewers desperately want to believe? They want to believe they can roll over and go back to sleep because democracy isn't really in danger from the GOP going insane. They want to believe they don't have to get involved. They don't have to pick a side because all politics sucks and all politics are bad and all politicians are corrupt. And really, it's just the extremes on both sides that are the problem. And if only, if only the sensible center would yada, 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 which you've already heard a million times. You've heard this bullshit from the good gray pages of the New York Times mm -hmm. to your family and your friends and your coworkers. And did you ever stop to ask yourself, how did this bullshit get into the heads of families and friends and co-workers in the first place? Well, the New York Times and a thousand other sources put it there and kept it there by repeating it over and over and over again every day for decades. And it has the same kind of narcotic effect on those audiences as Fox News and conservative radio has had on the right. It has turned the lie both sides do it into a kind of mantra, a magic comforting phrase to keep scary reality at bay, a magic comforting phrase they will hang on to like grim death. Now, in the last episode, we brought you right up to the moment when the both sides do it lie had collapsed in the face of the undeniable reality that Trump had been nominated and elected by the Republican Party. No, the, the Trumpist party, honey. The Trumpist uh -huh. party. No, no, yeah, no, no. That should have been the moment when both siderism died forever. But as we'll see, it never dies. But for the moment, it had to be put on a shelf while mainstream media scrambled to come up with answers that did not admit that the left had been right about the right all along. So on this episode, we're going to focus on one year, 2017. That was the year the elite media fell apart during the first weeks of the Trump administration but had almost fully returned to its mainline, both sides do it narrative by the end of 2017. And to do that, we need to go back in time just a little bit to the day Trump came down the escalator, June 16th, 2015. Now, by a wild cosmic coincidence, just one month later, on July 14th, 2015, Spiegel and Grau published Ta-Nehisi Coates's book, Between the World and Me. That book would go to the top of the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction in August and remain number one for three weeks and then top it again during the week of January 4th, 2016. And just two days after that book was published, Mr. David Brooks felt compelled to use his New York Times column to white explain racism and the American dream to Mr. Coates. And unbelievable. Went, this yeah. was unbelievable. It was, yeah. it was, it should have cost him his job. Everybody went, holy shit, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Uh, it went very, very badly. <laughs> and the column was entitled, <sighs> Listening to Ta-Nehisi Coates While White. 
Uh-huh. And, it, and it was vintage David Brooks. It was whiny and it was privileged and it was condescending. And the tone police were out in force. Quote, in your anger at the tone of innocence some people adopt to describe the American dream, you reject the dream itself as a flim flam. But a dream, su- uh, a dream sullied is not a lie, unquote. And sure, Mr. Coates, you're a fine writer. Pat him on the head and all that. Pat him on the head. But don't you realize that, quote, by dissolving the American dream under an acid of excessive realism, you trap generations in the past and destroy the guiding star that points to a better future. It was god-awful. And it was kicked around the internet like a goddamn hacky sack. And here are some headlines from Salon. David Brooks scolds ta Coates I think you distort history. Quote, the Times columnist displays more white privilege in one column than some white people experience in a lifetime. From Jezebel, listening to Han- Ta-Nehisi Coates while snuggled deep within my butthole. From Esquire, from Charlie, si- uh, Charlie Pierce at Esquire. Here's some stupid for lunch. David Brooks's American Dream. From Talking Points Memo, New York Times David Brooks has complaints after reading Ta-Nehisi Coates's While White. Then there were the wee digital shire folk like you and I who never show up on the Google as being newsworthy. This is from the Maha blog. Stop David Brooks before he expresses himself again. And from Alternet, David Brooks white whines over ta Coates' new book while appearing not to have read it. It was very, very bad. And you know what? None of that mattered at all. It wasn't the first god-awful slice of claptrap Brooks has served up at the Times, nor was, nor was it the 101st. But the New York Times editors and owners did not care and do not care because Brooks is not on their payroll to tell readers the truth. He is there to tell them the comforting lies they desperately wish to believe. Now, let's jump ahead two years to September 15th, 2017. By this time, Trump had poured an entire barrel of that acid of excessive realism all over the American dream. He'd been nominated and elected by the GOP, and it was already painfully clear that racism had won him the election and the rabid loyalty of the party base. And by another miracle of cosmic timing, on September 15th, 2017, ta Coates happened to be on All In with Chris Hayes on MSNBC on the same day that David Brooks was on the PBS NewsHour. Now, on All In... Mr. Coates broke down the deep roots of white supremacy in the Republican Party and how Donald Trump was the first candidate to run and win by openly embracing racism and white supremacy. Period. He was very clear about it. There was no doubt what happened, and he explained it beautifully. Meanwhile, over on PBS, David Brooks was insisting that, quote, this election was all all about anti-institutionalism. It was all about we don't like the way those things are working in Washington. Let's burn the place down. So it's not surprising the Trump administration is bad at institutions. Yeah, David, but what about all the, you know, racism? And when that question was put to him, he stuttered and halted. And I, 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 there, there's a mixture here. So sure, (laughs) Donald Trump played identity politics. Sure, race was a factor. But, quote, I think a lot of people voted for Trump for a million different reasons a lot of them quite legitimate reasons. So yeah, Charlottesville and so forth happened, and that was bad. But then Brooks literally said this, quote, but I don't think you want to play this election as, well, white racism won this election. I don't think that's fair. Wow. At this moment, yeah, I know. It, 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 well, you know, that's why he's on PBS, right? Yeah. That's why yep. he's on NPR. That's why he's on Meet the Press, to spread this bullshit yep. everywhere. Yep. And all the brain-dead idiots who listen to David Brooks and think he's a genius want to believe this wasn't about racism because that would open up a whole big door they don't want to go through. So at this moment, Brooks and the rest of the elite media are treading water. They're playing for time. They're looking for some variation of the both sides do it lie that they can continue to sell to their readers. Trump had robbed David Brooks of all of his usual gimmicks so thoroughly that in February of 2017, Rather than talk about the madness unfolding all around him, he resorted to literally reprinting a 20-year-old column almost verbatim. Same title and everything. A Return to National Greatness, a weekly standard column by David Brooks, March 3rd, 1997. 
and A Return to National Greatness, a column by David Brooks in the New York Times, February 3rd, 2017. And that's that's verbatim, one after the other. Yeah, it was it was almost a cut and paste of an old column from 20 years ago. Oh, by the way, just as a brief aside, uh, the phrase that Donald Trump kept hitting last night on his announcement he's going to run for president. Yeah. A return to national greatness. <laughs> we must return to national greatness. So way to go, David Brooks. You've scripted. You spent 20 years scripting Donald Trump's return to power. Oh, way wow. to go, man. And so by March of 2017, only three months into the Trump administration, the rebranding project had begun. Yeah. David Brooks, quote, the first thing we learned was that Trumpism is an utter repudiation of modern conservatism, unquote. Yeah. Not my baby. It's not my baby. Yeah. In March, David Brooks also shared a TED Talk with Gretchen Carlson. Remember Gretchen Carlson? About America's poor, misunderstood, bitter, white nougat center and how both sides need to listen more, damn it! As Brooks's fairy tales began falling to pieces, he began pleading for someone somewhere to give them a new paint job and sell, sell, sell them to the public. First came the wistful invoking of an imaginary past. Quote, One of the things we've lost in this country is our story. It is the narrative that unites us around a common, multi-generational project that gives an overarching sense of meaning and purpose to our history. For the past 400 years, Americans did have an overarching story. Has I'm he talked sorry. to ta Nehisi Coates about this story? No, he has not. <laughs> well, and remember, David Brooks has one diploma. Yeah. He has a bachelor's in history, history from the University of Chicago. <laughs> and they should be very, very angry with what he's doing with that diploma. But okay, I'm sorry, so I interrupted. Getting back to this. For the past 400 years, Americans did have an overarching story, which apparently did not include anything about slavery. It was the Exodus story. The Puritans came to this continent and felt they were escaping the bondage of their Egypt and building a new Jerusalem. I can't believe he wrote that. There yeah. are times you can't believe he wrote that. He he said 400 years of history, he ignored African slavery, and then pretended that somehow America was a liberating force for the Puritans. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he comes up for air in this column, pinning the blame on the academic left and the extreme right. We are not making this up. You mean both the left and the right are to blame for this? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Quote, yeah. today's students get steeped in American tales of genocide, slavery. Oh, he brought up slavery. Slavery, oppression, and segregation. American history is taught less as a progressively realized grand narrative and more as a series of power conflicts between oppressor and oppressed. The academic left pushed this reinterpretation, but as usual, the extreme right ended up claiming the spoils, unquote. Then he pleaded with his readers to go back to the let's pretend version of American history, quote, it should be possible to revive the Exodus template to see Americans as a single people trekking through a landscape of broken institutions, unquote. During this period, Brooks is hammering the both sides do it lie by abusing the word we so frequently he needed a restraining order barring him from coming within 500 paragraphs of first person plural pronouns from the end of March 2017 quote we haven't entered the age of milk toast bourgeois relativism instead society has become a free form demolition der derby of moral confrontation. The cold-eyed fanaticism of students at Middlebury College and other campuses nationwide, the rage of the alt-right, holy wars over transgender bathrooms, the furious intensity at every town hall meeting on every subject, unquote. Also this, quote, we see events through the lens of moral Marxism as a class or ethnic struggle between the evil oppressor and the supposedly innocent oppressed, yeah. unquote. He has a lot of um, um, different Victim words. Victim blaming? <laughs> he, he has a lot of words for uppity. Uh, yeah, that he, he sure does. He, he's uh -huh. got a whole thesaurus for uppity, yes. Mm -hmm. It's important to mention once again 
that the story we're telling here is not exclusive to David Brooks. He's just leading the pack. But, you know, there's Tom Friedman, Michael Gerson, Brett Stevens, Jennifer Rubin, the rest of the Beltway media elite, and the newly christened Never Trumpers. And now they are all parroting the same party line that something has obviously gone haywire with the Republican Party. But, number one, it wasn't their fault. Number two, no one could have seen it coming. And anyway, three, both sides. Yeah. I want to point out to you that David Brooks, we're, we're talking about 2017. But this year, October 20th of 2022, David Brooks has a column called Why Republicans Are Surging. Then on November 2nd, he had a column, Why Aren't the Democrats Trouncing These Guys? The <laughs> pathetic GOP still manages to thrive. And why is that? It's because of both sides. Both sides, you know, both and sides. And then two days after the midterm election, the fever is breaking. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's not. It's same shit, different day. He can republish a column from 20 years ago and still get paid for it. And uh, this is where we are. But let's get back to 2017. Yeah, because at this moment in history, if you had taken uh, a chart and plotted media hot takes on that chart, you would have noticed that blaming liberal elitism for the election (laughs) of Donald Trump suddenly (laughs) spiked during 2017. Because it has to be somebody's fault, except for uh, other than the Republicans who created the monster that now ran the country. In the New Republic, Michael Tomaski wrote, quote, elitism is liberalism's biggest problem. The New York Times, Joan Williams wrote, quote, the dumb politics of elite condescension. She said condescendingly. Slate did a whole Q&A about, quote, advice on how to talk to the white working class without insulting them. Stanley Greenberg, the American Prospect, wrote, quote, the Democrats' working class problem. Kevin Drum at Mother Jones asks for, quote, less liberal contempt, please. And don't forget all those endless articles about how campus liberals are ruining America just like Donald Trump, all of which was coming from the respectable conservatives in the mainstream media. Now, in July of 2017, just three years after he pronounced the GOP fully redeemed and completely fucking awesome, David Brooks filed this headline from the Aspen Ideas Festival. Quote, the GOP rejects conservatism because it seems that just that week, David Brooks had discovered that his Republican Party was full of Republicans who wanted nothing whatsoever to do with Brooks or his band of imaginary conservative intellectuals who apparently all labor tirelessly on distant mountaintops to humanely solve humanity's most vexing problems. Then came, I'm not making this up either, Spinners and Tuners Week, when Brooks once again divided all of humanity into two groups. Quote, The spinner is the life of the party. The spinner is funny, socially adventurous, and good at storytelling, even if he sometimes uses his wit to maintain distance from people. Spinners are great at hosting big parties. The tuner makes you feel known. The tuner is good at empathy and hungers for deep connection, unquote. Then David Brooks spent an entire column explaining what cool means to the kids, <laughs> you know, because the kids don't understand what cool means. And no, I'm again, I'm not kidding, because he's got nothing else to write about. This is from the New York Times. Quote, how cool works in America today by David Brooks. <laughs> well, I refuse to go into that article because I have a limited amount of time and patience, but it is exactly as bad as you think it would be. Then in July when everyone in America suddenly noticed once again that David Brooks existed and was terrible because he burned an entire column talking about his unnamed and possibly imaginary high school degree only friend who wanted to throw herself in front of a taco truck because the names of the fancy meats on the menu where they went to lunch made her feel bad. Now, Brooks's pinballing instability, bouncing from a wildly weird column to an indignant column and back again reflected the don't know whether to shit or go blind breakdown of the entire establishment media. Everyone was going through this. All the respectable folks didn't know what the hell to do. And during this time, Chuck Todd was running the Meet the Press false equivalence machine full tilt. And Brian Williams, remember Brian Williams was doing the same on MSNBC. And get this, he was trying to both sides the attempted repeal of Obamacare pretending on camera that Democrats were equally responsible 
for the 2017 Skinny Repeal Bill. And I know, we again, we are not making this up. No. He no. had a Democratic senator on his show, and he closed out the segment by saying, and that's one of the 100 senators who is responsible for what will happen tonight mm-hmm. to health care in America. Yeah, when are Democrats going to get off the bench? Right. When and, are Democrats going to get off the bench and own and own their participation in this? Yeah. When it was Republicans voting 60 times to repeal health care and pretend that they were going to replace it and they had nothing to replace it. And, and you and I were hunched over your laptop in tears. Yeah. Because there goes our, our health care. There health goes insurance. our kids' health care. Our health insurance was, gonna, was hanging from John McCain's thumb. Absolutely. Right. And, and Brian Williams and Chuck Todd and the rest of them are like, Goddamn Democrats, why yeah. aren't you doing your why part? Why aren't you doing more? Right, mm-hmm. right. Then Brooks decided, ah, oh, screw it. He was going to deal with the implosion of his conservative movement and his Republican Party by not writing about it anymore. His column in the New York Times was then entitled, Getting Trump Out of My Brain. Quote, for the past two years, Trump has taken up an amazing amount of my brain space. My brain has apparently decided that it's not interested in devoting more neurons to that guy. There's nothing more to be learned about Trump's mixture of ignorance, insecurity, and narcissism. Every second spent on his bluster is more degrading than informative. I, I want to I mention, David Brooks's job, the reason he was hired, the reason the New York Times pays him, is literally writing about Politics, politics, especially Republican politics, because he's right. supposed to be a goddamn expert in that. He doesn't have any other expertise. He doesn't have expertise in that. Well, but that's his whole he job. Has no supervision and no bosses at the New York Times either. Oh, no, because he, he can just decide, I'm not going to write about Trump anymore. One, you know, six months into the Trump administration, he's going to not write about the president of the United States anymore. Can you imagine any writer in this country being paid as much as David Brooks is being paid, deciding? Six months into administration, I'm not going to write about the president anymore when that's your job yeah, turning and still on the food, having a job the next day. And turning on the Food Network and saying, you know what? We're doing auto parts now. Right. We're going to do a comprehensive <laughs> assay of the car in my garage and all the little parts. Because gonna, food like, is taking up too much of my brain. It's just too hard to write about food. <laughs> when, I went to culinary school. I studied in France. But you know what? This pile of shit here. I don't want to deal with it anymore. So I'm going to go over here and talk about cars. Okay, that sounds great. Why don't you do? You, would you like more money? Would that be? Yeah. Why don't we give you a humility job teaching it at Yale? Yeah, about right. Cars. Teaching a class about humility. Okay. Jesus. A week later, David Brooks in the Times quote, and again he's paid to write this. We are at a moment when mobs on the left and the right ignore evidence and destroy scapegoats. That's when we need good leaders most. Unquote. This was the week when Rich Lowry tangled with Joanne Reed on Meet the Press. Why is a hobgoblin like Lowry still welcome on Meet the Press? Because he was willing to say stuff like this about the Charlottesville fascist march. Rich Lowry said, I do think Donald Trump obviously should have specifically denounced the white nationalists, but there are two sides to this now. The country now has a violent fringe on the right and on the left, both of whom, the white nationalists and the so-called anti-fascists who like violence, who thrill to violence, like the attention that comes with it. And this is going to get worse before it gets better. Now, did he ever reveal that some of the so-called Antifa rioters were actually Boogaloo boys? No, he did not. that, That happened in the past. Yeah. So the past <laughs> is, remember, the past is always off limits. The minute it comes yep. out of their mouths, it's you can't talk about it. Yeah. So Joanne Reed pushed back. Were, were they the anti-fascist beating clergy yesterday? Rich Lowry insisted, there was violence on both sides. Joanne Reed, there certainly was not. Rich Lowry, yes, there was. Joanne Reed, were they attacking clergy? Rich Lowry, you didn't see the video? Reed, I spoke with clergy who were being beaten with brass knuckles by neo-Nazis. Rich Lowry, anti-fascists also beat people up, break things and burn things. They both should be condemned. And you know the dog that doesn't bark in the night here? Yeah. Chuck Todd intervening saying, Rich Lowry, you're fucking You're lying. Wrong. Yeah. No, he, I, I'm sure at some point he said, you know, we got to move on. Right. And that was the end of the discussion because right. Rich Lowry had had made his point that it's both sides and that's why he was there. Mm-hmm. Now, a week after that, David Brooks was making a fancy meat sandwich out of his 
2006 column demanding a third party and his 2009 column entitled What Independents Want, in which he admired all those newly minted independents who suddenly showed up after the Bush administration fell apart. Now in 2017, the retread of all that bullshit was entitled What Moderates Believe. Quote, for some people, the warriors of the populist right must be replaced by the warriors of the populist left. For those people, Trump has revealed an ugly authoritarian tendency in American society that has to be fought with relentless fervor and moral clarity. Moderates do not see politics as warfare. Instead, national politics is a voyage with a fractious fleet. Wisdom is finding the right formation of ships for each specific circumstance so the whole assembly can ride the waves forward for another day. And if you're thinking to yourself, holy shit, no matter how hard or how often they get punched in the mouth, Brooks and the rest of the establishment media are never going to fucking learn, are they? Never. And I just say to you, congratulations. You have figured it out. That is exactly true. Trump had been in office barely eight months. And already, the both sides do a lie had been almost fully reconstituted and was now being advanced on all fronts. The rest of the year rolled by just like that, and leading the charge was David fucking Brooks. The both sides do a lie had been fully reconstituted about neo-Nazis in America. Yep. That's how bad it was. That's how bad it is. Uh Uh-huh. So this is Brooks in September of 2017. Quote, This account of reality, which I've certainly repeated, explains why the Democratic Party has moved from the Bill Clinton neoliberal center to the Bernie Sanders left. It explains why the Republicans have moved from the pro-market Mitt Romney right to the populist Donald Trump right. A month later, Brooks in October, quote, Politics during the hatchet phase gets nasty. It tends to devolve into a fight between upswingers and downswingers. Upswingers believe in progress and feel that society is still fitfully moving upward. Downswingers have lost faith in progress and feel everything is broken. Both right and left are dividing into upswinger and downswinger camps. Brooks still earning money for writing this stuff in December. Quote, what's wrong with radicalism? There was a striking moment in the focus group that consultant Frank Luntz recently held with a group of Roy Moore supporters in Alabama. One of the voters said that the women who are accusing Moore of harassment are being paid to do so. Luntz asked the group how many people thought the women are being paid. A bunch of hands shot up and voices called out that all of the women are being paid. That attitude is evident on the pro-Trump right, but also on the left. (laughs) Again, at this point, (laughs) it's just an algorithm. Anytime you hear the right, he plugs in left. Anytime you hear Republican, he plugs in Democrat. It literally doesn't matter what the topic is. That's the lie that all of these scumbags are selling, and they are all still out there doing it all these years later. Well, speaking of both sides are scumbags, at the end of the year, CNN's Michael Smirkanish played the both sides false equivalency game with the reaction to the allegations against, again, Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore. We also find Joe Scarborough, who, by the way, now has a, had a column in the Washington Post warning America, and this is Joe Scarborough, quote, the only way to escape that cycle is to break apart the hyperpartisan two-party duopoly that has kept Washington too divided, too dysfunctional, and too directionless. For so long. Scarborough, you owe Matthew Dowd $5. $5. By the way, they weren't really directionless when they were holding a beer party in the Rose Garden celebrating that the House had repealed Obamacare. No, at all. They had a very clear direction. Yep, very clear undo, direction. Undo everything Obama did as fast as they could. Right. This was all combined with the media's aggressive revision of the Obama administration with stuff like this. This is back to David Brooks from December 17th, 2017. Quote, the central problem of our time is the stagnation of middle class wages, the disintegration of working class communities, and the ensuing fragmentation of American society. Our political leadership has shown an amazing ability to look the other way. George W. Bush fought a war on terror. 
Obama devoted his presidency to expanding health insurance. Donald Trump is all talk and no policy, unquote. This is how, in less than one year, the elite media muscled a story about how the left had been right about the right all along out of the way so it could get back to telling their reassuring both sides do it fairy tale. And how did David Brooks ring in the 2018 New Year? By wringing his hands over, quote, the radicalization of the Republican Party and a new form of identity politics, especially on campus. <laughs> That's it. Republican Party has lost its mind, and there's people on campus who are doing speech code things. Pretty much the same thing. Um, and you know, want to know the, the truly sad and scary part of all this. This is not David Brooks failing at his job. This is David Brooks doing his job. This is his one and only job for which he is paid a princely sum every month by the Schulzberger family and the New York Times. And we will dive right into more of this on the next episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, which I think is going to be the last David Brooks. I think so. Podcast. I think so. You know, I think there's, it is. There's, I'm, I think it's actually deeply interesting mm -hmm. for me to go through 17 years of archives and just yeah. thread this into one whole cloth. This is the big blinking arrow telling you where the mainstream media is going every day of the week. Mm -hmm. And it's always followed the same path and it's always been led by the same people. And that's why they still have jobs, even though they're horribly wrong. But after five, I think we, we will uh, move on to something else. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to another episode. Please keep your comments and feedback coming. Again, our plan is to do more of these before the end of 2022. We're kind of on a schedule now. We're sort of, we sort of gotten into the gear. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have enough Patreon donors, we're going to do these every week on Tuesdays next year in addition to our regular Thursday show. Don't forget, we are looking for 300 Patreons, and we're at about a 135 right now mm -hmm. uh, to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions. <laughs>